God is good. And all the time? Yes. No matter what we go through, no matter what we need to go through, he's still good and he can still use it to bring his good and his purposes out of it. I did get rid of my boots. I gave the boot to Daryl. <laughs> so I still have to be watching, you know, that I don't twist and turn and do too much um, just yet, but I can at least walk and get around, and it's, it felt so good to get out. So good. Anyways. Well, sometimes there's just things to talk about that maybe aren't quite the, the easiest things to talk about, but we're going to talk about one of them this morning. And you, you've no doubt heard about um, things that are said in social circles, that when you're in social circles, you avoid the topics of politics and religion. Okay, you avoid those things. It's better to talk about the weather, talk about how rainy and miserable it is, or talk about how sunny it is. It's better to talk about maybe things that are going wrong in the news and stuff like that. But don't talk about those two things, because your opinion is not something about either of those things that anybody cares about. So we don't share. Um, and, you know, today we could probably add to that list, we don't talk about politics, religion, or things that concern morality. People don't want to know your opinion about moral issues anymore. And so people kind of avoid those kinds of things. Well, in church we also have topics that are considered taboo to engage in often. People tend to shy away from topics of sin, hell, and money. Those three things nobody wants you to talk about in church. But Scripture talks about those things in detail, and so, as I've said before, if Scripture talks about it, then it's good enough for us to talk about. Amen? So we're going to engage in one of those topics today, which is the topic of tithing. And I want to begin by reading a couple of scriptures that probably are going to seem kind of odd to be talking about tithing with. But, you know, tithing is more than just the obligation to give money. Tithing is also about just obedience, and it's about the heart. It's about faithfulness. And so we want to talk about um, the, the, the topic of tithing in that particular light this morning. I do have my flicker. And we're going to begin with Psalm 34, verses 9 to 11. It says, Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have what? All they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will what? Lack no good thing. And sometimes, you know, that, that in itself is something that people are worried about, that if they tithe, then they will lack. But Scripture says that if you trust in God, if you fear Him, if you are obedient to the things that Scripture talks about, then we will lack nothing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 says, And we can be sure that we know Him if we obey His commands. And then one more, 1 John 2, verse 5 says, But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. And that is how we know that we are living in him. So there, there are several reasons why people um, choose not to talk about or choose not to do the act of tithing. And mostly they would say that, well, they don't have enough money to tithe. Or they somehow don't believe that we are mandated to tithe as a New Testament church. Some have said that they don't think that the church 
um, distributes the money properly. And so they're not going to, to tithe into that. They, they take it upon themselves just to rebel against that because they don't believe the church does it right. And then others simply don't put much effort into making sure it's done. It's not that they don't believe in it, they just don't put effort into it. It's not part of their regular discipline. But you know, I can confidently respond to each one of these. And I want to respond um, to each one of these things um, and approach the topic of tithing with the undercurrent of trust and faithfulness. It's not something that we talk about a lot. We probably should talk about it more, but it's necessary once in a while to look at how we view it in light of Scripture. And so right now, off the cuff, I want to deflate any lies that the enemy might try to spread in this room. And so I'm going to tell you right up front that this is not a legalistic sermon. This is not a shaming sermon, and it's not a prosperity sermon. What it is is a sermon about provision, blessing, and investment through tithing. So what is the tithe and what does it mean? Well, a tithe is one-tenth of a person's goods, whether in, in the Old Testament especially it would have been agricultural, um, money dedicated to God, and the practice of tithing has changed since the Old Testament period. You know, we don't bring in our cows anymore. Thank you. In Cuba, they bring chickens. <laughs> I wouldn't have a place to put chickens. So it's changed since the Old Testament. But the concept of New Testament tithing, which includes us, we're part of the New Testament church, is the setting aside of one-tenth of one's income for religious use or for the church's use, and that has remained the same. But tithe means tenth. I want to share with you what a man named uh, M.G. Easton said. And just so that you know, it didn't come from me, it came from him. He says, a family that finds itself unable to make a commitment of a tenth of its resources to God should realistically examine its spending and living habits. Perhaps that will require a critical examination of spiritual values as well. If more funds were needed for family conveniences, the average family would somehow find the means to buy what they wanted. That didn't come from me, but I happen to agree with it. Somehow we seem to be able to find the resources to go shopping for this or purchase that online or go here or do whatever. If we want it bad enough, we'll find the resources to do it. And so, in that light, there's really not a reason to be able to say that we cannot place one-tenth of our income towards being obedient to what God requires. And, you know, we recognize that there are extenuating circumstances for stuff, you know, somebody living with an unbelieving spouse that doesn't agree with it, we modify, you know, we, we accommodate for that. The issue would be that whatever you can do to make up what you can of that 10%, and God will see your effort, God will see that you are doing what you can do. And so it's not that this is the legalistic stuff that we don't want to do, in saying, you know, break up your marriage over that. No. But you do what you can do in order to accommodate that 10%, because that's what we're going to be accountable for. And we will be accountable for that. So I want to look at tithing in, in three kind of veins. First of all, tithing throughout the scriptures, and then tithing with a right perspective, and then tithing as this house, as higher heights. What are we looking at? So let's start with tithing through Scripture. We see it all through. 
Genesis 14, 18 to 20 records that Abraham gave a tenth of his possessions to Melchizedek, who is identified as the king of Salem and a priest of God most high. Genesis 28, 12 to 22 records that after dreaming of a ladder reaching to heaven at Luz, and we talked about this, I think it was last week, Jacob vows to give a tenth of his possessions in gratitude of how God will bless him. Numbers chapter 7, verses 1 to 7, talks about that when Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, the leaders of Israel, the heads of each of the tribes, they came and they presented an offering at the temple. They brought their offering before the Lord, and their offering happened to be things like covered carts and oxen, um, and two uh, ox from each one represented in, in front of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was built almost a year after the exile from Egypt, and so they had a dedication ceremony. And then after that initial dedication ceremony, they had regular days when they would trade off um, coming to bring their tithes and their offerings. They would bring their animals and spices and, and anything else that they would have to offer as their offering. And they repeated that week after week after week. And to us, that's, that's kind of a tedious thing to do, but it underscores there how all the tribes in unity brought their tithe to the Lord in the temple. They, they all did their part. They all did their share. And a lot of what they brought was to support the priesthood. Tithing is successfully reinstated as part of Hezekiah's worship reforms and priestly reorganization. He, he totally reconstructed the temple. And he says, you know what, we're going to look at what the Bible says, because we haven't been doing it. We haven't been doing anything. And so we're going to take a look at what, this, what the Scripture says, and we're going to put it into practice again, because we're missing something here. In Nehemiah 10, 32-39, the people vow to reinstate the tithe after the exile. In this case, the Levites would collect the tithes and, and bring them there. The Levites are the priests that minister in the temple. And instead of everybody bringing it to the temple, the Levites went out and they collected it from the people and brought it in. The New Testament references to tithing most often appear in Jesus' rebukes of the Pharisees. And Jesus talks about money a lot, doesn't he? The importance of it and the importance of putting it in the right priority. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Wisdom tells us to honor God with our wealth. And the best part of everything that we produce. And then, this is the good part. If you do this, then it says, he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. See, it's not all about just emptying of our resources into something. He fills it back up with more. He fills it back up with abundance to overflowing. And then letters to the churches, tithing and giving are frequently spoken of through the letters to the churches. And so scripture is full from beginning to end that it's a principle that we live by as believers. Tithing with the right perspective. Malachi 3.8. Many of you have heard this verse before. Will a human dare to rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and in the contributions. That's a Lexham English Bible. In the New Living Translation, it says this. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? Well, you have cheated me of tithes and offerings that are due to me. There's a scriptural mandate towards tithes and offerings. Does God need our money? 
Does he need our physical money? Scripture says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and everything is his. He doesn't tangibly need that money. He's not saying, if you don't give your, your money, then I can't do anything. He doesn't need our money. Tithing is more about this. Tithing is more about our heart towards God. Tithing is more about trusting him and expecting that as we are faithful and obedient to him, that he's going to honor his promise. Giving is an outward material expression of a deep spiritual commitment. Tithing and giving demonstrates how your commitment is towards God. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So where's your treasure? Where have you placed your treasure? What is it that you value most in life? Your house, your car, your sports equipment, material things. Where do you invest most of your energy? What takes most of your financial commitments? And what are your desires that sometimes keep you awake at night or maybe cause you to worry about life? Those things indicate where your treasure lies, how you respond to those questions. Giving tends to check our attitude. If we give grudgingly, as if, okay, God, here it is, you know, just take it. He doesn't want us to give grudgingly. He wants us to give with joy. Why? Because we can partner with him in sowing seed into the kingdom. We partner with him in doing what it takes to bring people to Christ. We partner with him in the mission of taking the gospel to those who need it. We partner with him in the acts of benevolence that tell people and show people in a tangible way that Jesus loves them. And so we give with joy with a different perspective, that God is not a taker just for the sake of taking. He wants to give back in abundance. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one should give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or from compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver, and so we give out of a grateful heart. Thank you, God, that you have provided for all my needs. Thank you that I have food on the table. Thank you that I have clothes to wear and a roof over my head. Thank you that I have a car to drive. Thank you that I have the ability to help my neighbor. We give with a grateful heart. Malachi 3.10 Bring the whole tithe. Everybody say whole tithe. Oh, everybody say whole tithe. Into the storehouse. Say storehouse. That there may be food in. And he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to even store it. If we are obedient to tithing and offerings, we won't have... He's going to give us more than we can contain. And the thing is, when he gives us more, it's not for us to hoard it. When he gives us more... It's for us to have resources to be able to then sow again and maybe sow more. And then as we do that, guess what happens? We get more blessing in return. 
And what we've emptied out of our vats, God pours in some more so it overflows again. People in the corporate world know this. People who own businesses, they understand this principle. That the more they give away, the better their business prospers. It's just a principle that God has set out for mankind. That if you are obedient to this principle, and we sow into his storehouse, and the definition of a storehouse is a, a place for storing goods, and it's an abundant supply or so resource, we have the ability in this house, if we bring our tithes, to have our storehouse filled to overflowing, so that we don't have to try to count pennies in order to do things. We go to our storehouse and say, we have this resource that we can offer to spread the gospel. We have a resource right here because, you know, God needs us to take the gospel. We have a resource here because somebody is sick and needs this. We have our storehouse filled to overflowing. And then the words that there may be food in my house. That's a way of saying that there would be the sustenance that's needed in this house. It's not my own choosing of a charity because I don't think the church delegates the money correctly. I've heard people say that. The church doesn't do it right, and so I'm going to choose. I'm not going to tithe to the church. I'm going to give to this and this and this. But that's not what God says. You don't get to choose. Your job is to bring it into the storehouse so that there's food in this house. And then you leave it with God to do what needs to be done. And so when we make sure that God's house has enough abundance, then he will make sure that we have enough abundance. And this is not prosperity gospel. This is the blessing of God in return for faithfulness. We give our tithes in order to give God our hearts. It's really a heart thing, folks. It's tithing with eternity in mind. I'm sowing seeds so that when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to see what my seed did. We might see some of it here. We might see that as we sh we're sowing that we are able to harvest and bring people into the house. But when we get there, <laughs> we're going to be able to open our treasure box and be able to see what we were able to accomplish here out of our faithfulness. This is kingdom investment. And so we need to think of tithing as more than just putting money into the plate to pay the church bills. It's an act of obedience to God, and that act of obedience disciplines my heart and matures my relationship with God. And in so doing, I allow the work of the ministry and the vision of higher heights then to be accomplished. Through my disciplined heart, my faithfulness, and my growing maturity with God. Tithing is an act of sowing seed so that there can be a harvest. And that, that's really itself a principle of sowing and reaping, isn't it? And it, it even says that it, those who sow sparingly, what? And those who sow generously, what? That's right. Tithing is a kingdom principle based on God's economy. God has a totally different economy. Maybe you've heard that before. God's economy is different than the world's. And so we need to sow into his economy. Tithing is a release of something without the need to maintain control over it. 10% belongs to God for this house. It no longer can be considered mine. Actually, it never was in the first place. I release it for God to use how he sees fit, 
And those decisions, as we experience church now, are entrusted to the leadership that we vote into office. And that leadership will be accountable for how they use that. Accountable to how they use God's money. My offerings are given above and beyond that. God talks about tithes and offerings. Tithes are the first 10%. Offerings then are, are my choice. Those things to, if I want to sow into a particular thing, if I want to give to a charity, if I want to give to a particular ministry, if I want to give benevolently to somebody. And when we give to help support a ministry cause, it's beyond that. And it's not a payment. You know, often we hear people say, I need to pay my tithes. It's not a payment. It's a returning of something back to God. We return our tithes to God. And so let's, let's bring it home here. One thing I've observed and heard from people is that Higher Heights is a very giving church. And since I've been here and, and through all the, the lockdowns and, and you know what we've been going through for the last couple of years, people for the most part have maintained their faithfulness in giving. And that has been a huge blessing on Higher Heights. Things like when Karen's daughter needed help because of her house fire. People pitched in and helped with that. And God sees that. It, it, it was a giving above and beyond our tithe. Every week, you see in your bulletin, weekly expenses and tithes and offerings for the prior week. And this has not been equal. We've had more expense than we've had coming in. And this is just something that the, the board wanted me to bring to your attention as I talk about tithing, is that we need to make that at least equal out so that we have enough to cover the house. We are praying for God's favor and blessing to be on this house so we can do the work of the ministry in South River. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to be able to accomplish the work of God in South River. We want to be able to offer ministries to people and offer a place for people to come. And all that requires the faithfulness of the congregation. We're praying for God's favor and blessing, but we can't expect God to honor that request if membership is not doing its part. Do you understand the blessing of what tithing is? We will be blessed personally in our homes, in our finances, if we continue to be faithful to God for what he's asked for. You know, I've heard stories of things like debt cancellation, People being miraculously blessed financially because they were faithful to God in giving of the first 10% of their income. And this is one place where God says to test a minute. We're allowed to say, okay, God, I'm going to be faithful in this area. And I'm expecting to see your promise for me. He says that we can test him in that. And God will be faithful. That blessing and favor will fall on this house if we are faithful. He can take our faithfulness and multiply it. We can you know, look and wonder, where'd that money come from? And maybe you've encountered that experience personally in your home. I know at times we have, like, where'd that come from? I didn't know that was there. 
And it's not the last 10% if we have enough left over. It's the first 10% that is given in faith and with joy out of our income, trusting God that he will meet every other need after that. That's where the faith and the trust comes in. And our faithfulness to be obedient no matter what. When we honor God with our tithing, we set ourselves up for his blessing. And his favor. I, I watched my parents growing up be very faithful in this area. And they owned a couple of different businesses. And even though they went through their struggles, they always had enough. And I watched them as they went through their struggles. Every day, I heard them that they prayed and they read scripture and they trusted. They voiced their trust in God in prayer and, and God, you know what's going on and we just believe that you're going to work it out for us. And God did. God was faithful. He came through for them. For Daryl and I, in a time of difficulty, and a time of, you know, just that faithful giving, we saw a $30,000 debt wiped. Just because God showed his faithfulness. There are stories of people who have had nothing in their cupboards, and yet every day they opened the door and there was a meal. God provided because they were faithful. People who not only tithe but learned how to manage the rest of their money with integrity and wisdom and ended up with more than they could dream of. We tithe our first 10% and then the other 90 we use with integrity and wisdom. People who have learned that the more God gives to them, the more they have to give away. Not for us to hoard, but so that we can give it away. And we don't have a tight fist. We let it go with an open hand. See, God is a God of abundance, and his economy is different than the world's. And if we're going to receive the rewards of his economy, then we need to invest by his economy. Amen? So I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes right now. And I'm going, to, I'm going to ask some questions just for you to think about and respond in your own heart to. Have I been giving what God requires of me? That is the first 10% of my income. Have I been giving with joy? Have I been giving but still wanting control of what I give as though to tell God what to do with his money? Have I put conditions on God? God, if I give, then this is what I want. Do I live in fear that if I do give my 10% that I will not have enough to meet my needs? How you answer those questions determines where your treasure is. And that says a lot about our heart condition before God. And really, it's all about our heart condition before God. And it's about kingdom investment. And just for the record, your giving is not about me. It's not about Pastor Lisa at all. I'm just the messenger that sometimes needs to tell it like it is. If God is speaking to you about any of these questions, then allow him to help you become more obedient in this area, to be a good steward for his glory and his kingdom economy. Amen? And we can smile. I love your smile. Greta has a good smile. Let's stand together. 
I just want to reiterate the first scripture that we read, Psalm 34, verses 9 to 11. Fear the Lord, you his godly people, for those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Amen. Father, we just thank you that we can be a part of sowing into your kingdom. What a privilege it is, God, to know that my seed will feed somebody, or my seed will bring the gospel to somebody, or my seed might even save somebody's life. My seed can go towards bringing revival to this region. My seed will make sure that this house remains and the ministries of this house can continue on and grow as as we sow into them and people come and are able to be discipled by them thank you that i can partner with you and father we just pray over the finances of higher heights right now and we ask god for your favor we ask god for your blessing we ask God that if there are those who need uh, assistance from the Holy Spirit, just to be faithful and to learn to trust you with their finances. God, I pray that there would be an element of trust in you that would grow in this house. And Father, as we are faithful, that we would indeed see our vats full, our storehouse full, and we would have need of nothing, but we would have lots to give away. And so, Father, I just pray for your favor and your blessing as we step up to the plate and are obedient in this area as you've called us to be. And, Father, I pray for each one that is here today. I pray, God, that you would minister to them personally and minister to their family. And I pray that you would place divine appointments in front of us this week, that we would be able to tell others about Jesus, about his love for them, about how much he cares for the things that they're going through. And God, we just want to say we love you. We want to say that we want to honor you in every area. And we give you praise because we know that you are the God who saves. You are the God who saves. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. And everyone said, Amen. I'm going to close with a song.